Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited to have Brian Massey, who's one of the top conversion optimization experts. Brian is known, as you can see, as the conversion scientist. Yes, he's got the lab coat too. It's the only other person I've interviewed who also has a lab coat on. And his, in his over 20 year career, he spends his days and nights optimizing clients' websites to increase their revenue and leads. They have some really interesting clients and they've had amazing success with the barcode company, college universities helping them getting students and donations in addiction treatment centers, just to name a few. We're all over the map. Yes, and Brian, thank you for joining me. Glad to be here. By the way, you know there is a psychological effect called um, enclosed cognition okay. in which the person wearing a lab coat or a uniform actually has an increase in their ability to uh, answer uh, cognitive problems. So essentially their IQ goes up a All few right. points just by putting on a lab coat. Well, so uh, by the way, you look marvelous today. <laughs> so do you. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> there's so much I want to find out from you, Brian. And um, you know, one thing I want to start with is you were mentioning we were talking com- the research, the competing for college students online report. Yes. Tell me more about that. So, our mission is to change the web one website at a time. What we want to do is we want to make the web better for people who are visiting websites. People uh, are having a better experience on the web when they are finding the thing they want to buy, when they are subscribing to the content that they want to receive regularly, or when they're finding that bit of entertainment that just lets them let go of the day for a little bit. And so our goal is to do that. And the way we know that someone is finding what they're looking for is that they buy it. <laughs> so Amen. Yeah. We're hoping to we're hoping to ha- take an approach in which uh, we improve the web by making it better for surfers and for the businesses that are selling. The thing is that um, wh- our job is to come in and find ways to learn about the people coming on the web so that you can better give them what they want, help them find what they want, and make a good decision buy from you. Yeah. So our job is when we're increasing um, the number of people who are buying from the traffic you're already getting, we're doing mm-hmm. things better for the buyer, we're doing things better for the business. So we want to know for colleges and universities, and we've optimized a number of college sites, as well as a major college and university search engine. It will tell you everything you need to know about colleges and universities and help you Pick one based on your stats, how you did in school, Mm -hmm. what sort of thing you're looking for. Um, And so we found a database that would tell us which college and university sites or any business that's competing for students online have certain tools installed. So how many of these universities have an A-B split testing tool installed? Mm -hmm. That's what we use when we you really want to be that. sure something that something works, hmm. we can tell that. We can tell how many people have um, click tracking software, what we call heat map software. This software lets you see where people are clicking on pages, and you really learn a lot. Um, and I'll share, share some examples yeah, of go some ahead. things we've learned on that at, at, at one point. Um, have they installed live chat? Have they installed ratings and reviews? So we want to look, wanted to go in and look and see the things that we know a business that is optimizing their site would have installed. Yeah. And uh, the bottom line of the report, and uh, it's a free report, so I recommend you get it from conversionscientist.com, uh, is that not very many. So <laughs> those people that are spending like over $50,000 a month on paid ads, 14% of them have split testing software installed. Wow. I mean, think about this. They're spending. So how do they track? When you talk to them, what do they do to track this stuff? They they track it, but they don't optimize. And they're like, well, we're paying, we're paying, I have the budget, so we're getting the, the students that we need. But if they're spending one point three to two point seven million dollars a month on paid advertising, some of these companies, and uh, all the you know a small increase in conversion rate would make that spend go so much further. So I was a little bit baffled by it. But we go the, the report goes into with the state of the industry, how few people are, have these tools installed, and this is a huge opportunity for smaller schools to come in, use these tools to reduce their acquisition costs, and essentially outspend the big guys without spending nearly as much as the big guys. 
That's what we're all about. So it's a very interesting uh, report, I think. We're going to be doing it for a series of industries over the next 12 months. And uh, it also has some advice as to what you can do if you're involved in, in marketing uh, to students, what you need to do to, to take advantage of this what, this gap that we've got. Yeah. So that yeah, that's what I'm excited about right so now. So, Brian, what out of the report surprised you the most once you got it back? Really, how few big spenders are investing in some basic tools. I mean, you know, conversion optimization isn't easy. Um, it takes time. Uh, it takes some experience. There are some interesting learning curves. But when you get up those learning curves, you have such an amazing competitive advantage. Oh, huge, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll toot my horn a little bit. If you can bring a team in that's already ready to do that, show you how to get set up and running, uh, certainly give us a call. But, um it's right now a competitive advantage, kind of like search was in the early 2000s. Those people that went in and figured out, oh, if I put the right words on my site and I had other friends linking back to me, I'll be at the top of the, the pages and I'll be getting all this. And they made millions of dollars. Well, now it's at the point where you have to do that even to exist because everybody mm -hmm. has figured it out. I think conversion is going to be in that place in 24 months. Mm-hmm. Five years, I don't know what it is, but I know that the businesses we're working on are going to be kicking the ass of their competitors. So, yeah. where are you going to be in that? Yeah. So, I mean, I know a lot of kids when they're growing up don't say, I'm going to be a conversion optimization expert when I grow up. So, I want to find out how you got to this point. Um, so, what, first of all, when you were growing up, what was a big influence for you? What was a big influence for me? Actually, the, probably the biggest influence for me, and I'm going to age myself or date myself mm -hmm. here, but a uh, friend of mine. You don't had, have much gray hair, so you're not you're not dated. So, well, I'm not coloring it, but it it, it it's lying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most people have more gray hair at my age. Um, I'm not going to tell you my age, but I think some of you'll be able to figure it out. A friend of mine got a computer, one of the first computers made by Radio Shack, hmm. called a TRS-80. Uh, or the trash 80 is what we affectionately call it. Got it. And um, we started programming that basic. And this was nothing like what we have today. There was there were no graphics. Everything was done on text. Uh, but it was fascinating. And that's really what got me into programming. Um, I learned pretty quickly. So I went to school and studied computer science. Learned pretty quickly that um, I don't want to be a computer programmer. I wanted to go out and be in sales because I saw one of these IBM guys in his blue coat and his red tie. Back then, that's what they... They had that was their uniforms, what they were known for. Uh, so I went into sales. It seemed uh, like uh, Brian, back up for a second. It seemed like you always wanted to do something in business. Was there like uh, someone in your family that influenced you to be interested in business in general or computers or? Well, my dad was one of those people that was a, just not a good employee. Never wanted to be employee. Never lasted as an employee. So he's always kind of his, his own guy. Yeah. And what did he do? That was a big uh, influence for me as well. What did he do? Was he in sales or? Uh, he was in sales, yes. Actually, he was in form sales. So he sold forms to hospital. All those things you oh, fill yeah. out when you go to the emergency room. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the he, forms. He sourced those for a, a lot of hospitals. And, okay. Uh, of course, that business went away with the computer. Right. Uh, I tried to get him, dragged him, drag him into that, but it was a different business. So next, so, yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, that was, a, I think that was a big influence. Um, so I went into sales. Uh, I, um, you know, not a very good employee. I had ideas that I, I wanted to change the organization as much as, as meet my quota. Uh, so got out of that, went back into programming, um, got promoted into a marketing position in a small company, decided I thought I could run the company myself better. So I went off and started my own company in the 90s. What kind of company and was it? We did, um, we, we had a, a kind of a unique niche. We wrote software for the web that focused on graphics. So to give you okay. an example, in 1998, we had Google Maps working on dial-up on Windows wow. 95, a Windows 95 operating like, system. Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, because in the U.S., uh, you know, wideband adoption had been, uh, we did this for Jet Japan, and they had a faster adoption of um, broadband um, but, I mean, we had uh, satellite photos going across this uh, geo-accurate uh, vectors of streets and things. So it was quite, wow. a, quite an undertaking. Very advanced for that, for even for that. It time. was. And a little bit early to market, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after that, so in the, in the, the, with the dot-com bust, uh, we had a couple of key clients go away. And so um, I was back building 
web backends for businesses here, uh, primarily here in Austin. I wrote my own analytics package because there was I wanted to see what was going on, how people were using the web. Mm -hmm. um, Google quickly, you know, bought Urchin and then quickly improved that so that uh, I didn't have to do all that development. Boy, I bet you could still find my old project on SourceForge. Let's find somewhere. it. Uh, open source online marketing or awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we will provide a link to that if it's still up there. Oh my God. Um, anyways, I I don't know what you do if you're a computer scientist with sales marketing experience and you just have this entrepreneurial itch there's only one thing you could be and that is a conversion scientist so yeah uh now there are four of us um technically so so who uh, do you who do you look to as colleagues when you bounce ideas off each other in this in the conversion scientist world you know the thing is it's different for every business but there is a group of us um uh, names that I think will become household words in the next, like I said, two to five years. Yeah. Uh, Ollie Gardner with Unbounce. Yeah. Craig Sullivan is over in the UK. Uh, right here in Austin, there's a bunch of us. So Brian Eisenberg and Jeffrey Eisenberg essentially invented this industry. They're mm -hmm. awesome. They live in here in, in uh, Austin. Pep Laya of Conversion XL. Yeah. Uh, great blog, conversionxl.com. You know, on a par with my blog, quite frankly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, better than my blog in a lot of ways too. Uh, check it out. Uh, gosh. Uh, uh, so what's just, a big revelation you had from a conversation with one of them? We just had a conversation last night, as a yeah. matter of fact. Yeah. And um, you know, there was a, there was a bit of a, a heated debate between somebody who was kind of a pure marketer, like, okay, I'm going to come out and I'm going to create a, a a product and an offer and the creative that supports it. Oh, and then you guys come in. And we're like, no, 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 no. Optimization happens at all levels. And so there's a there's a series of questions you ask at the beginning. You might do yeah. focus groups or you might do a survey or you do sort of the very expensive step of saying, I think this will work. And so you'd launch it to see if it works. Uh, those are all very expensive. Uh, so if you look at what we do for a living, we actually are at, we're at a, a place where the business has gone through the most expensive research, launched it, found its niche. We're the ones that come in and can very inexpensively increase the revenue because we statistically have this traffic that's already coming. All we have to do is apply some of our tools, and it becomes really inexpensive to find that next 5% growth, 10% growth, 15% right. growth that at the front end was very expensive because you had to do all that research or build something and hope it worked. Yeah. So that was, you know, that, those are the sorts of things as we start to understand our role in the ecosystem better, um, you begin to understand those sorts of things. Um, and I don't know if that resonates with your audience, but um, uh, these are the sorts of things as we uh, th these are the sorts of things that are important to me. So yeah, yeah, I'll share it with you. It's it's been recorded, so they have to live with it, right? Exactly, exactly. So, what kind of question do do you ever suggest people then have you come on before they launch? Or oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But the sort of conversion that we do um, doesn't lend itself well to that. Okay. So um, we have some resources of people that will know how to apply best practices. And best practices are things that have worked for other people. Uh, one of the things you will learn very quickly uh, if you, when you begin optimizing in your business is that the th common sense doesn't exist. Things that work for other people aren't going to work for you. Right. And very often, that's ugly, frustrating. It's pretty. It is very well. It's fascinating, I guess. Yeah. Um, when it shows up in my business, when I spend a lot of time on right. a great piece of content, I pay designers, and then it, nobody comes. Yes, it pisses me off. Yeah. But still, it's fascinating. <laughs> it's uh, a good way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I think that um, uh, getting. Uh, tell me your question again. Um, it was, I don't even remember now. I was just, uh, <laughs> I think it was, you know, um, what's something surprising about it. That's the most surprising thing is, um, I guess that brings me to a, a question. I was, when you just said that about, so what has, what did you think in your mind? This is going to work. There's no doubt about it. And then when you put it out there, it didn't work at all. Like yeah. you were saying, this is what we were talking about. You were saying about how frustrating because Everything common knowledge gets thrown out the window, and all the stuff you think is going to work may not work for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there is a site that we're working on. Uh, the number of times that I've put something out that hasn't worked is is too numerous to count. Quite frankly, that's how you learn in this business, right? Fail fast, fail cheaply if you can. Um, 
there's a website where that we're optimizing, and uh, the the catch here is that where it's a lead generation site, and we're optimizing to increase phone calls, not form fills. We don't know we don't want the form fills to go away, but a phone call is worth ten of those form fills. Mm. So we're willing to give away a few form fills in exchange for phone calls. Yeah. Well, as it turns out, the uglier we make the site, the more phone calls we get. Hmm. So we we started off. We said, well, we want phone calls. Let's let's take the form off altogether, right? Then everybody has to call. Phone calls plummeted. Wow. So we said, all right, we better put it back on. Uh, and we said, well, if we wanted to put it back on, what if we made it longer and uglier? We made it longer and uglier. Phone calls went up. We said at the top of the thing, well, you should call us, but if you really want to. We discouraged them basically in the copy from filling out the form. And phone calls went up. And on the pages there, the uglier we make it, the more ugly fonts we put on, the multiple fonts, the – uh, more crowded we make it look, the more phone calls go up, um, sure. and it's only having a moderate effect on the form fills. So th- this is just one example of like you know it's a head scratcher. Um, uh, are we going to go and recommend to all of our other clients that they should make their sites <laughs> ugly if they yes. want phone calls? Uh, yes. To an extent, yeah. You know we're like put a big ugly form on there. We'll start testing from there, and we'll figure out what your audience wants. Uh, so these are the sorts of head scratchers that are both fascinating to me and yeah. Um, you know, you can only get there by by traveling the path. There's, yeah. You can't you can't uh, charter a jet. Yeah, Brian, I would think the same thing. You take everything off. You put a phone number there. I would think the phone increases, but not at all. What's yeah. another head scratcher that you've had that goes against your common sense? Um. Well, I mean, uh, in general, we find the the pretty produced things don't work as well. Um. Uh. Sorry, I'm. I'm drawing a blank here. Um, sliding uh, headers is something that is perplexing. So a uh, sliding header is when you come to a website and it's got the big hero image at the top and every few seconds it goes whoosh, and another image comes up with another marketing message goes, whoosh, and another one. Yes, yes, yes. So almost across the board when we test those, they reduce the conversion rate. Mm. And we think there's two reasons. Number one, we think it slows down the loading of the page because you have to load four or five or ten of these big images. Mm-hmm. Number two, our brains are wired to pay attention to motion because whenever we see something move, our limbic like system, our <laughs> yeah. lizard brain has to say, is this going to eat me? Is this something I can eat mm. or is this something I can mate with? Yeah. So you see something moving. you those are your key questions. You got to <laughs> go and, and look. So you're reading through a page, and every few right. seconds, you're, you know, you're like you said, squirrel. <laughs> you're going back and looking at the top of the page. So you can never really get into it. So those two things are some combination of those two things. Yeah. Um, so what we usually do is we say, uh, you know, when we say, don't do this, the, the client inevitably comes back and says, well, our designer told us to do this, and everybody else is doing it. So what are you guys talking about? So we'll go in and we'll test each of those. We'll find out which of this one by itself with no motion converts the best. And then we have been able to order them in the order of the most popular to least popular and actually get a slider to work better than a, st- a statistic, uh, a static image is what I'm looking for. The words I'm looking really? for. Really? Worked better? It worked better. But there's some other variables that, that, that are there. Um, it needs to rotate unfrequently, infrequently, okay. nine to ten seconds at the earliest, hmm. and needs to be a slow fade, not a. Whoosh, whoosh. So uh, we've been able to. We got like a sixty percent increase over static uh, for one of our clients, and wow. we've tested on a number of their product pages and seen the, the same results. So, if if you haven't tested your slider, take it off and go static. Yeah. But if you can do the series of tests to get to the, the slider that works, uh, test your way to it and and. It'll work for you. Yeah. There. So, Brian, when did you first consider yourself a conversion optimization scientist? I be I you know I would coined that term I think in two thousand and five. I ter- coined wow. the term conversion science in two thousand and five in my original blog, which was called Customer Chaos. And this is a blog that I was writing at the time uh, in the um, in the it was in mid two thousands, and I was actually going working for companies. I think I alluded to the fact that I'm not a very good employee because I love building stuff and I like, oh my God, this guy's awesome. 12 months, he built out our entire back end and they're like, okay, just put quarters in it now. Like send the emails and stuff. And I'm like, 
I want to build something else. So I'll either get fired, or, you know, pout till I get fired or quit. And I was in the middle of that sort of thing. So I was writing a blog that was, you know, really critical of corporate marketing and it was making it hard for me to find jobs. I probably, because they were reading it, they're like, you know, all the stuff you criticize on your blog, that's what, what they do. Yeah. That's what we want you to do for us. And I'm like, not going to be a good fit. Uh, anyway, so I was writing that blog. I, I, I coined the term conversion science in late 2007 when I said, you know, I've just got to go off and do this. Um, I went with conversion sciences just because it had been coined and um, it had kind of stuck with me um, uh, because it's really what we do. We apply the scientific method to websites and uh, I was concerned about it because nobody knew what conversion was then. Right. No one really knows what conversion is today. It blows my mind, but... uh, I was a little afraid of that, but it has turned out to be such a great uh, branding move. People remember the lab coat. They remember the science thing. I am a little bit of a left brain guy, so it, it works in terms of the kind of content that I'm creating. Um, and we have fun with it. I mean, we do um, everything from beakers for coffee mugs around here to wearing our lab coats when it gets cold, um, you know, and uh, uh, we. We create fanciful machines like internet microscopes and um, uh, speed speed transmitters and things like that that don't really exist, but give you a sense for the sort of things that we look at mm-hmm. when we're optimized. So it's fun. We have fun. Go check out conversionscientist.com. You'll see. Yeah, you've conversion all about scientists the and, and conversion sciences too, right? Yes, we have the two domains. Yep. I wouldn't recommend that in retrospect, but that's. Really <laughs> So what do you do? What do you find then? I mean, that's pretty early for conversion. We can now people are still starting to get into conversion. What do you do? What did you do then? And then what do you do now that you've improved on from when you first started? Great question. Great question. So I was I was brought into this. I went to a um, Wizards of the Web seminar that Brian and Jeffrey Eisenberg put on, and they had just start. You know, they had just published a book called Waiting for Your Cat to Bark. Yeah. Uh, and it, you know, if you are interested in the deep beginnings of conversion and the kind of the basic concepts, if you're designing a website, I strongly recommend it. Uh, followed by my book, Your Customer Creation Equation. Um, I saw that and I was like, this just fits everything. So I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. Yeah. And literally uh, uh, worked with an SEO company that was far sighted, and they were like, well, yes, we want not only to bring traffic to our customers, but we want that to convert so that they stay and work with us. So I worked with them for nine months and really refined my offering. And what it was back then was very persona-based. So we would sit down with the heads of the uh, departments of these companies, someone from customer support, someone from marketing, someone from sales, uh, ideally the CEO, and we would begin to filter through what their three to four personas were for Hmm. their website. Yeah, yeah. And it was just eye-opening for these guys. They changed their taglines based on what we like. So I didn't realize that our customers were like that. What did you find? What were they like? What their customers were like? Yeah, what did you... It depended on the business. It depended on the business. Every business was different. But um, when they started thinking about the way people make decisions at, kind of at a core, which is the core of waiting for your cat to bark, or am I a spontaneous guy, or am I a methodical guy, or am I a competitive guy looking for what's in it for me, or am I a humanist, and I just want to know what your company's like and who your people are and how I'm going to feel if I buy your product. <laughs> and you start to realize yeah. you have different these different segments coming to your site, and that's yeah. really what it was, is early segmentation. Yeah. Um, humans relate to humans and so instead of saying well should we should we release this feature or should we f- talk about these three benefits or these three benefits to you know those benefits are going to be really important to mike but carrie she's not going to care about those we need to add one of these in so that if carrie comes to this page she'll she'll understand that you know we're human people or right? mm-hmm. whatever the the persona was and it's very 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 powerful um it's very powerful yeah yeah. So I spent most of the first four years or so doing that. Um, and it's uh, honestly, it's a bit of a difficult value proposition. I'm going to come in. We're going to create scarecrows that are standing in your field that will guide your marketing. And if the business didn't develop the discipline of keeping those people front and center and continuing yeah. to go back to their personas, yeah. then the, the value they got from them was was lower. So um 
I met uh, uh, my partner, co-conversion scientist Joel Harvey in 2011. He brought the operations side into it, and we started saying, all right, we're going to do the personas, but now we're going to do the testing. So we're going to take what we learned from those personas, turn them in hypotheses, and actually find out if we were right about this, mm -hmm. if the personas are guiding us. Yeah. And uh, so he really implemented the core of our business today, which is um, setting up the analytics, examining the analytics in the site and the employees and whatever we need to develop hypotheses, ranking those so that the low-hanging fruit bubbles to the top. And we can talk a little bit about why that's important. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, doing the actual test because we do this all day and night. And if we come up with 100 ideas that we think will improve the conversion rate of the site, probably 50 of those won't. It's kind of so scary. it's really important yeah. that we go ahead and do a test and verify which of those were good hypotheses and weren't. And yeah, that is scary because the last thing we want to do is come in and, and reduce the sales on a, for a business online. Well, the scary part is that for someone like you who knows what you're doing and you do see tons of tests that do work, even you have a 50% rate that won't work. You know, yeah. like, whereas someone who doesn't know, what, what percentage are they left with, you know? Yeah, uh, and you know there are some people that are just intuitive and already intuitively know everything about their market, and they're doing great, and uh, they have high conversion rates to show for it. The data shows that they're they're doing great, but for most of us, for ninety nine percent of us, we need to we need to find some data that reinforces and helps us make yeah. decisions on what we're doing creatively. Yeah, Brian, I want to hear about the low hanging fruit, but I want to ask about the personas because that seemed to be early on, and even today, how you start your hypothesis. What's your method? for going in or if there's an example of you going in and creating, helping people create a persona? Because I would think they may think they know what it is, but it may be different from what it actually is. Yeah, probably the, uh, you know, one of the best examples is we, um, we did a um, set of personas for the, um, uh, there's a University of Texas at Austin is here in Austin, and they were building a conference center, the AT&T Conference Center, and they needed to understand how to take that to market and how to build the website around that. And um, so they had built kind of a standard hotel website. You come to the hotel, it says how wonderful the hotel is, here, check your dates. But it turns out that their most valuable visitors, after we got into this this meeting and this, this, this process, were the convention bookers. So hmm. over the lifetime uh, uh, of the uh, the uh, uh, one of these relationships, they were worth half a million dollars, wow. not a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. Focus on that, night. right? Yeah. Right. And when we dug into what these folks did, we found out they were methodical. So they're putting their reputation on the line. They're bringing not just the people in their company, but their clients, the businesses, clients, and customers to this center. So they're going to want to know everything. What's nearby? What are you going to provide me? What do the rooms look like? What do the facilities look like? What's the stage look like? Are there restaurants in the hotel? What do they look like? What kind of food do they serve? On the For time off, what's nearby that the people can go and, and do touristy things on? And the list was pretty extreme. And I had specced out um, in terms of recommendations because once we have this – design, we've got a little bit of demographics, how old they are probably. We've got their customer commentary, which is in their voice, what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. Very, very powerful. Yeah. And then what we call points of resolution, the thing, the pieces of information they just need to know to feel comfortable and confident. And I pull that and I create recommendations and said, yeah, you're going to need to, you need to have some sort of room explorer. Or you have to have a facility explorer where they can see the, um, you know, the layouts of each of the rooms where they can actually see pictures of the inside and stuff. And one of the design firms picked that up and actually went in and did 360s of mm -hmm. the room, of the main areas, of the um, uh, the, the, the um, dining areas and the outs. And it was such an excellent interpretation of the recommendations and it performed very, very well for them. It's a very successful center. So, I mean, I think that's just a great example of where we've taken the assumptions of designed me a website and completely turned it on its head and really yeah. were able to focus resources on the things that were going to bring in those big fish, those yeah. really important um, customers. How do you discover that convention bookers were the people to focus on? We asked the salespeople. Said, I mean, so uh, the first question we have is, who are your most important customers? And, and that mm -hmm. can be important in terms of who's most profitable, who generates mm -hmm. the most revenue, who's easiest to close, who's just coming to the site most often. So you can use any of these criteria to start to focus in on 
who you want to d design for. And what you want to do is design for the most desirable customers because you'll get everybody else. A website is not a laser. It's, it's more broad. So right. you will get other people. They'll find their way to the content that they want, but you know at least you're producing journeys for the most common, most profitable, easiest to close, whatever you yeah. think you want to target with the personas. Yeah. I love that. Simple question, but so powerful. It uh, is. And it's, it's not an easy question. And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of research that goes into the beginning of running your business. Are you, every time you're going to write an email, you're going to go through all your reports and all the interviews that you did. No, you've got a persona that you can just speak to, mm -hmm. review the points of resolution and make sure that you're hitting those important points. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a way of organizing your research. Yeah. And Brian, you were mentioning the low hanging fruit. I know in the beginning we were talking a little bit about the low hanging fruit process. When a company comes on, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So I know a lot of the entrepreneurs listening to this, um, I hope a lot of the entrepreneurs listening to this have put a toe in the water on conversion. Yeah. Um, the most, you know, the most intuitive and probably successful will have. Wink, wink. Um, and w what often happens is you do some tests, you get up the learning curve on those things, and they're inconclusive. And what we mean by that is either they didn't increase your sales, uh, they lowered your sales. Or they increased your sales and you didn't realize it because things weren't set up right. Um, we don't want that to happen. We want to instill a conversion culture or a data-driven marketing culture mm -hmm. or at least a our marketers aren't afraid of mathy stuff culture into these businesses. And the first way to shoot that out of the water is to have a series of these inconclusive tests. So it's very important to us to make sure that we find winners early on, both mm -hmm. because of our mission, but also people don't keep paying you if you have inconclusive tests. Right. So we have developed a process. Uh, it's a waiting process. So I talked about the hundred or hundred and fifty or two hundred ideas that we could come up with for a site. Yeah. Um, we have a waiting process, and we put it into a spreadsheet that we call our ROI prioritized hypothesis list. A name which Very will tell you we're not a we're not a branding organization <laughs> because a branding organization would call that something cooler like. The quick win list or something. Low hanging fruit method. The low hanging uh, fruit method. Yeah. That's what we. That's what we go for. But anyways, we're pretty good at understanding. So for each idea, we say, well, is there a lot of evidence for this? In other words, can we look at analytics and see there's proof? Or did mm -hmm. somebody in sales say that this is a question they always ask? Uh, is it hard to implement? So let's. The, the hypothesis says if we change a headline, that's easier to implement than a hypothesis says let's develop video for the site. It right. takes a lot more work. Right. Harder to test. Um, Based on our experience, what sort of an impact do we think it will have? What other tests have we seen where it's worked or not worked? Um, and uh, when we roll all this together, it becomes a weighted, um, it becomes a weighted hypothesis list. And when we start at the top, we see a couple things. Number one, which which things are uh, most likely to make a big difference and easiest to test, but also we see what category they go into, which what sort of bucket they go into. And there's really five broad buckets that we lump things into. And if we see that, for instance, trust issues, the people coming have trust issues uh, based on our hypothesis list, we'll focus in on that. But what we would like to do is say, take something from the trust world, take something from the layout world, from the messaging world, from the, and tr try one of each of those and start to understand what the big deal is. So in every site, there's usually one thing that's driving people crazy. And you don't know what it is until you, you, you try some things. Is it trust? Is it that you don't look credible? Is it that they don't get your value proposition? Um, uh, is it that you you know you don't have ratings and reviews? There's not a social proof on on the site. Mm -hmm. uh, once we find that, we trace, we drill down into it like a vein of gold, and we try to find, make that issue better, 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 and then we back up and try the next one that tested well. So um, this this is where we are more likely to have wins early on. Uh, our value is that. Within six months, we will find not only enough money to pay for us, but enough money to pay for us and for you to put a lot in your pocket as well. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to pick winners in that six-month period if we're going to get that pulled off. So what were some low-hanging fruit? I mean, for a barcode company, what, what could possibly be a low-hanging fruit for something like that? Or, or anyone that you think would be a good example that was interesting? Uh, well, you know, the barcode uh, company was actually a big success. We, um, 
We have tripled the number of demos that they're getting. So they sell inventory software and barcoding software for people who are managing assets very within sexy. the company or an inventory in the warehouse. Yes, very <laughs> sexy. By the way, B2B e-commerce, online e-commerce, trillion-dollar industry. Uh, you guys better be optimizing because these businesses are getting sophisticated. Um, anyways, uh, what we found was that they had a page that had uh, a lot of choices. So you can get a demo. You can do a trial. You can order a catalog. And over here was a little floaty thing that said, try a demo. Uh, they offered a consultation in some places. And so what we did was we took all that off, or we tested this. Yeah. We took all that off, and we let, left it to two. So either you demo, do the demo or learn more. And conversion rates went way up. Um, we went in, and on the form that, that were, where they filled out the demo, uh, they had a video there, and it's a very nice, handsome guy saying, hey, you should really do this demo because it's going to be 30 minutes. And, and I thought, wow, that's great. That's a great use of video. Took the, vi the video off. Conversion rate went way up. Wow. So we had to leave the video off. Um, we found out uh, – we've just recently found out that we ha we're down to two buttons. That if we take one button off with the right words on it, <laughs> right. one button, demos go up again. So What did it like, say so, on, the, on the button? Uh, went from live – uh, went from uh, live demo to live consultation. Okay, I believe live demo to live. I'm just smiling because I could see like there'd be nothing on the site except the like you're just taking stuff off and there's just like one button. <laughs> no, we've tried that. So yeah. simplification is one of is one of the things that early on we we turned to and we've actually kind of gone away from because um, it's it simplification is not enough. It's yeah. not enough. Uh, it's more of a design issue. So how is the design guiding the eye? Mm -hmm. Not so much. So one way to do it is like put less on the page, but then you don't get certain questions answered with, mm. with content on the page. Right, so. right. But yes, we could work our way that way. Um, the designer took some liberties and made things more complex and more interesting, I mean, more beautiful. And we we're like, beautiful sometimes doesn't work. But as it turns out, his, in his instincts have been very good. And, okay. Uh, and we have the data to prove it. That's the bottom line. And so you, you hire somebody to come and redo your website. The odds are uh, exceptional that the conversion rate will go down on a redesign. And you've just changed everything. So you really don't know what's hurting and what's helping. Yeah. So this company has been very smart to change the design only a bit at a time. And we know exactly what changes are, are driving more people to demos and what's getting more people to complete the form. Yeah. So what about, Brian, what was uh, for the addiction centers? What were some interesting things you found? <laughs> so the addiction centers um is it important the, i mean honestly that's an important thing is, to get people it, into it, addiction centers who have problems so i could it, see that being a very worthy worthy you know, cause we are absolutely 100 yeah. percent behind what the addiction centers are doing yeah. um uh absolutely and you know the, the people that run these companies really are they're they're entrepreneurs but they uh really get into this because it's important to them um uh and the uh, I know at least two of the several that we're working with uh, were founded by people who had struggled with addiction. Yeah, yeah. So they're there to help, but they're also there to make money. And it's a high stakes game. It's very expensive to the to buy traffic and and leads uh, to help you uh, get people into beds. Um, and phone calls are are absolutely golden. So we we talked a little bit about phone calls and and um, you know I think that the our experience really from the addiction center standpoint uh, has been that that. Um, getting people on the phone, encouraging them not to delay, showing them how they can take real action in a crisis, mm -hmm. that sort of a sentiment. We did one um, really interesting test on just changing a headline. And yeah. choices we had were um, um, uh, we can help with the phone number. And by the way, here's a great tip. If you're interested in increasing phone calls, put the phone number in your headline. That's been one of the most consistent wins we've had. Uh, it said, um, ready to start healing call. It's, uh, the third one we tested was, speak to a compassionate rehab specialist call. And the last one was, ready to stop lying, we can help call. So that last one, obviously, is like, oh, wow, is that A little really? edgy, yeah. And it turns out the, uh, the one that says, ready to start healing, which we call, um, it, it's a uh, styrofoam copy. It's you know sloganish. Um, it actually reduced con reduced calls. Uh, 
compassionate rehab specialist. We think compassion is emotional world. We've all got someone who's treated us with compassionate, hopefully our mothers at least. Uh, and there, I think it was a 32% increase. Uh, and then the one ready to stop lying increased phone calls by 42%. Wow. Why do you think? Well, that's huge. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we have two hypotheses behind that. Number one, it is, it is emotional. It's not, it's not styrofoam copy. Uh, number two, it is a component in every addiction, both the loved ones that are coming for their I addicted gotcha. family members. I got gotcha. you. Uh, uh, it, it, there's denial on that side, and there's lying happening from the addict side. Mm. And then I think that it does, so that this lying happens on both sides. So it is a headline that appealed both to family members and to the yeah. addicts that might be coming to the site yeah. looking for help. So it's very – those sorts of things. It's so an emotional – Emotionally charged sentence, yeah. Yes, and we're talking with human beings. Whether you're selling, you know, uh, gloves. There's a company that we work with that sells construction gloves. Uh, emotional words, I think we're going to find also work there. And and like what? What? What humans. type of emotional words with construction gloves? I, I, that doesn't. <laughs> no, nothing uh, rolls off my tongue for that. So we haven't. We haven't completed any 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 tests there. But yeah. I mean, it, it isn't that hard to think about. So you go to the persona. Yeah. Somebody who is um, uh, somebody who is in charge of buying gloves for the team. You know, it's a construction crew or you know maybe a major manufacturer. And uh, so, what are they looking for? Well, you stop and you think, uh, low prices. Yeah, maybe. Um, but. They're not as interested in saving money as improving their job, their Protecting career. Protecting their, yeah. So what are the things? If you can go and you can say that, you know, you got a volume discount or that um, if if sent to a shipping dock was free shipping or – so the more emotional things in that are going to be things that are related to their job. And um, I'm like you. I can't really on the fly say yeah. – uh, how we would word that emotionally. Yeah, and yeah. emotion for the sake of emotion is not what we're looking for. Emotional relevance is what we're looking for. Yeah. And so Brian, I, what do, what is your process for coming up with the headlines? Because you have like four or five different ones. What's your process for kind of going through to even have those as a test? Right. You know, I think the most helpful thing is um, speaking to someone who's in sales who deals with the clients. They will start to give you the words that people are using and the words that they yeah. use. Uh, if you're dealing with an e-commerce site, we read the transcripts of all the ratings and reviews so that we can start to get yeah. whatever people are bragging about or complaining about is telling us what's important and how they're describing it. Yeah. Live chat transcripts are amazing because live chat script, transcripts are by definition a transcript of things that were not able, were not answered on the website. Um, so that's another great source of those things. Yeah, yeah. And, ads if they're if the client is running pay-per-click ads we can go in and see which of those is generating the most clicks yeah. and start to understand something about how to present offers there so yeah. and one of the clients we had um they were sent they their best performing clicks were for uh hundred dollars off twenty percent off uh but their website was focused on what we call the relational sale so they were selling window treatments uh, high-end window treatments where somebody came to your house and presented everything and measured everything for you and gave you an estimate. So they had this this transactional discount-oriented visitor coming to this much different humanist. And so what we did is we built landing pages that were all about the discounts and their calls, their their schedules, uh, scheduled uh, visits went went way up because yeah. we matched the we matched the tenor of that yeah. with the you know instead of uh, get have someone come into your home. It was uh, people. People will be able to visit you, and they will come with discounts. <laughs> <laughs> I want that person in my house. <laughs> you know, so that's emotional. Yeah. But it's, it's relevant emotional. Yeah. Not a your grandmother will love you because of your window treatments. Sort of an emotion. Right? Yeah. It's not manipulative. No, you know what? All the questions I ask, I love your answer. It always goes back to the customer. It's very customer centric, very persona centric. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What they're saying. So love we it. call it we call it rigorous creativity. So there, even though we're science and lab coats and statistics and testing and all that, what we're really doing is helping you pick the right creative to bring people into your value proposition, so mm -hmm. that they can 
they can make a good decision about whether it works for them. Yeah. So it's a rigorous, it's a disciplined creativity, not a, oh, I think we should have a slider on the homepage. Let's go do that. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, yeah. I love your different voices too. Um, the <laughs> was I using a voice? I didn't. I didn't use. Yeah, a you do. You're good. Um, what tools? I mean, people. I think often wonder what tools should they think about and you mentioned a few um, not necessarily going to granular companies but you mentioned like live chat and heat maps what other mm-hmm. things should people start to think about as far as tools go for for converting well uh an analogy i like to use um but with qualifications is an ant farm mm-hmm. So I don't know how many of you guys had an ant farm. And for those of you that aren't familiar with them, it is two panes of glass very close together. And you fill it with dirt yeah. and you put some ants in there and they tunnel down through the dirt, but they can only do it in this this plane. So you get to see where the tunnels go. You get to watch the ants do the anti things that they do, uh, you know, where they take the food, what they do with debris. It's 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 interesting. Now, I don't want to claim that your customers, your clients, your visitors are ants because they're not. They're people. But your analytics database is that. You set it up and you let it run. And if, if, you, if you don't yet know how to use it, go ahead and let it run. Because at some point in the future, as you grow, you're going to hire a company like ours. You're going to bring somebody in-house that's going to begin asking questions about your visitors. And you're going to say, well, we have Google Analytics installed, and it's been tracking things for the last two years. And they're going to be able to go in and run some reports. And they're going to know stuff about your visitors, right. where they go, where they take the debris, where they go out, where they go in, where they buy, where they don't buy, that you have never been able to use. So I would say at the very least, mm-hmm. get analytics on your site. And in our report that we talked about at the beginning, um, in the university and college space, between 75 and 87% of the colleges or the organizations had some sort of analytics on their site. So this is not new. Mm-hmm. Probably not new. Um Absolutely do that. That becomes the, the ground on which when your competitors start optimizing past you, that's going to be your holy grail of, okay, here's what we need to go do. Um, you know, beyond that, every business is a little bit different. We generally see positive results with live chat. There's a complex number of reasons. Number one, because people will do it. There's a certain segment that will be so grateful for live chat. But if you have live chat on your site, people that would never chat live see that and think, well, oh, there's really a business behind here. So it increases your credibility, increases the trust levels. Um, So I'd recommend that. If you're in a uh, social proof right now is so important, I would go and find a solution for ratings and reviews. Mm -hmm. Um, We've seen mixed results with recommendation engines where, you know, you're on a product page and says, you may also like, unless it does a good job of tying related accessories. So you get the the stereo, and it also recommends the universal remote or something like that that's directly related to mm-hmm. it. Um, uh, one of the um, you know one of the things that we've learned a great deal about uh, for, about sites from is click tracking, and there's some inexpensive solutions for click tracking. And what happens is this software sits behind your site and it shows where people move their mouse mm. and what places they click and it ends up giving you a weather report. So you look at the page and the places where a lot of people are clicking are this red, hot, red hot spots and the place where they're not, it's cool like like drizzle or no rain right. and it's really fascinating to find out what people are clicking on. We had a, a, a university client that had a, um, a get more information form on every page and we looked at the click map and there was one field on the form that was red hot but nothing else. So they were clicking on this one form field, but they weren't finishing the form or clicking submit or anything. That's like, weird. That is weird. So we went and, and, and looked and it was the um, that was the part of the form that asked your area of interest. And we looked at the rest of the site and we went, oh my gosh, they don't ever just list what programs they've got in one place. It was all built out into this navigation tree. So we took that, we moved it into the body of the page, and we increased form fills by 20% wow. because we were like, oh, yes, they have my major. Now I can fill out the form. And uh, just little things like that. So Crazy Egg is a great solution for that. Um, uh, we pretty much recommend that. Clicktail does that as well. Um, and Clicktail brings a feature called um, session recording where you can actually record the sessions and sit and watch people dumbfounded on your site. Like, Friday night, yeah. Why isn't he clicking? Why isn't he clicking there? Why isn't he clicking there? And you look and you go, 
oh, it's not really obvious, is it? We never thought of that. Um, the, this is a fun game. This is a fun business when you start to understand your client and you kind of start to understand where your own blind spots are. Absolutely fun to do, and I, I'd recommend any entrepreneur use the web as a data source because what you learn on the on the web, you can take to your email, you can take it to your direct mail, you can use things like that in your catalogs. However, you're going to market, you're, you know, understanding your visitor is is it's cheap and it's fun. Yeah, Brent, I wanted to talk a little bit about those five things uh, for a second. Um, but are there any other successful tests or failed tests that stick out to you that we should mention? Well, you know, we did a, a huge test for an apparel company in which we actually spent a day in the studio filming video. And um, so if you could imagine, we, well, so when you're split testing, the idea is to control all the variables. And video is very dynamic, so it's difficult to control the videos. But we knew that we could control the dance step that the model was doing. We knew we could keep the model the same for all of the products. We knew we could keep the music the same for all the products and all the videos. So we ended up spending a day um, with this fitness apparel company uh, to this cool music. It was cool at the beginning. It was irritating by the end. <laughs> she was doing all these steps, which included in each routine, uh, there were at least five squats. And they had to be squat squats, like all the way down Real to the deal. knee squats because yeah. it's a fitness company, right? You know. Um, so by the end of the day, she had done some 500 or 700 wow. squats. And, you know, at the la when we were doing that last product, because we had 23 products we were doing, wow. and we did five versions of the video for each product. Uh, you know, at the end, when she did those squats, she was like... They need a stunt double. She had to yeah. keep her, her smile on, but you could just <laughs> tell she was... Anyways, we rolled that test out, and we reduced, con we reduced revenue per visit by 14%. After all of that, so wow. we actually lowered the revenue of the website with video. And we we dove in afterwards and, and looked at some of the segments, and we found out that um, people who are coming in and looking at tops, because the video is fundamentally different when you're featuring tops versus bottom, um, uh, on a Chrome browser, uh, had like a 28% increase in revenue per visit. And we started seeing all these seams. Uh, they wanted, if we showed the 30 second version with the wide shot to somebody who was a returning visitor on Safari, then we got a 52% increase. Wow, that's <laughs> and, very specific. Um, it is, it is. But this is really, so when we first come in, we're really optimizing for the broad audience or for the largest segment, whatever that might be. But as you get more sophisticated, you can begin to optimize on a segment-by-segment -segment basis. And the browsers are a great proxy for the different kinds of visitors that are coming in. So we picked one uh, that worked across these these um, uh uh, these different segments, and we were able to get a, a, a relatively small increase. If we could have optimized and and given the right video to each segment, we would have gotten a forty three percent increase in revenue. That's pretty amazing. Yes, but the 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 difficulty of having that kind of personalization and then split testing on top of it is uh, is it's not there yet. By yeah. the way, anybody running a company that does that, call me. <laughs> right. Um, so that was you know that was an example of picking from lower down on our. I, uh, prioritized hypothesis list, taking a big swing, which sometimes you want to do, yeah, um, and um, having to eat some crow around it. Yeah. So the five things I just wanted to highlight them because you mentioned them throughout. Um, you know the the value proposition. So the five things I guess you look at with the site. Yeah, uh, we call them. They're the buckets that we put our hypothesis okay. into. Um, so I'll tell you up front, the ones that we didn't have the most success with, and it might be because we test the most, uh, is, is language, is the words. So the words that are in a headline, yeah. the words that are on a call to action button, uh, either on a product page or in a uh, lead generation form, uh, the language that you use as a preamble on forms, uh, and then the way that you lay out the copy, because uh, we always get wins when we lay copy out that allows scanners to scan and really understand what the copy is saying, as well as has good copy for those that are reading and really looking to, you know, see if you know what you're talking about through right. your copy. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, value proposition in language is one of the first places we start. Um, 
one of the places we find the least success with and one of the things that are most often focused on by every web, desi web redesign is the design and the layout, right? So um, moving things around, we generally have less success. Um, making it prettier generally doesn't give us the big wins that we find with other buckets. So this, you know, I think this is one of the core issues with when we say, oh, I don't think our website's fresh enough or I don't think it's given us enough business. Uh, they say, let's redesign the whole thing. And it's not going to help. What you need to do is understand which of these buckets is the issue. Yeah. Um, uh, credibility is, is huge, so it can be anything from are you a member of the Better Business Bureau if you're, if you're a local business to uh, what awards have you won, what clients do you have, um, and even in a purchase scenario, we make sure that the right credit card logos are there because that's, that's just borrowing trust. Yeah. Social proof, ratings and reviews, um, and even I think live chat fits into that because it's showing that you have people behind the, the, the company putting your phone number on a website, even if you're only a web-only company, makes you feel like there's a company behind it. Uh, your logo fits into um, the, the trust issue. You don't use a logo unless it builds trust, right? Uh, and testimonials from a social standpoint uh, um, are important. So what have I covered so far? I've covered uh, layout, text messaging, social proof, um, credibility, credibility authority. and trust, uh, and um, risk reversal. Yeah. So how dangerous is it for me to take action here? What um, privacy policies, return policies, and even things like free shipping. If I had something to cart before I've had a conversation with you about how much it's going to cost to get that thing to my door, um, when you offer free shipping or flat rate shipping, all right, I know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I can add to cart, and I know that when I get to the end of my cart, it's not going to be an extra $100 that I didn't expect to um, you know, it didn't expect. Nobody likes to feel stupid and have to back out of a cart. So, yeah. um, those are the five buckets, really the, pri the primary buckets. And every everyone who does a, does what we do slices it up a little bit differently. But I think you'll find the same kind of the core issues in in every case, whatever they call their models. So it's, yeah. it's I see some consensus. No, thanks for going over that because that's I think the way you frame it is really powerful and it makes people kind of think of what they should be doing or need to be doing yeah yeah um, there was um, you know on the on the test side there was a, a company that um, they actually uh, published essays you could actually download essays on a variety of different topics and so their perception was they're in a bit of a sketchy industry right um, they added a Facebook connect button to their their form they said you know to sign up and um, no one clicked on the Facebook Connect button, but there was an 88% increase in form completions, and it was just because Facebook's logo was there. It added that a little bit oh, more really? trust. So it's amazing how these little symbols can really yeah. make someone feel comfortable taking action as, a, as an example. Yeah, Brian, since it's Inspired Insider, I wanted to hear about one, what's been a really low moment and then how you pushed forward through it and then – on the flip side, a proud moment. Well, you know, I think our um, our lowest moment would have to have been when we um, signed up to do pay for performance. So we had a deal where we were being paid a retainer, and we also got a bonus based on how much we increased the conversion rate. And as you can imagine, on a complex site. It's really hard to determine how much was how much of conversion rate increase was due to the market, how much was due to promotions the company was going to do anyway, and how much of it was due to us. But we came up with a formula that would take this measurement and this measurement and this measurement and average those, and in, and if it went to this, then we got a certain percentage of 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 revenue. And we had um, a month go by. And it was a huge increase, and it looked like our bonus was going to go through the roof. And we're like, "Yeah, hey, we just started. We know we didn't make any change. So we started working did it very vigorously. And the next month, we had worked vigorously. They had had specials. And again, we had a bonus that was just through the roof. And, um, you know, we felt like we had to stick by our guns because that was the agreement. I mean, if every time the bonus was, you know, in our favor – um, and just coincidentally was, you know, early on rather than being lower early on, then uh, we wouldn't have much leg to stand on for future agreements like that, which, by the way, we don't do anymore. 
Um, so it ended up being a very um, confrontational negotiation. We came to a good settlement, and we lost a customer. We lost a very interesting customer out of that. So that was kind of the low point. You mean they said it wasn't due to you, and so they didn't want to pay you the bonus? That's right. And we said that's painful. We said you 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 might be right. It may not be due to us, or not all of it. But the agreement says this is how we calculate it. And so we want, I mean, that was the agreement. We're going to calculate it using this. Um, And, you know, we had offered to cap it. And they said, no, 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 we want you guys to be motivated to really, you know, make us rich. And and I think we could have. I wish we we had um, been able to keep going with them. How do you navigate that type of negotiation? Because it is a client relationship, but then also you deserve to be paid a certain amount. I'm sure this happens all the time in a lot of business type of situations, what did, how did you come to the table and how did you handle the, the negotiation? It's not an easy process. Well, I think probably the most important thing we did is we got on a plane and flew out there. Um, and, you know, the face-to-face, um, the face-to-face made it um, more confrontational, but realistically confrontational. There's an amazing ability of the human mind to read somebody's face. So, Rather than trying to read their voices, read their mm-hmm. faces over the phone, we knew where they were. So um, I think that was probably the most important thing. Um, uh, never wavering, but we did compromise. We didn't take the full bonus. We told them what we were willing to take. Uh, we did a good job of preparing our, our, our case for it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think that's all you can do. Yeah. Um, what would you tell someone if they deal with the same situation, someone backs out of an agreement, what advice do you have for them? Um, well, it, uh, I guess my, you know, we always took it from the point of, li- we didn't, we didn't, we, we talked about litigation, but we didn't see that as a tactic and we didn't mm-hmm. use it. So, um, you know, I think, uh, holding the other side to their highest, in other words, expecting, even when they get heated and, and what, what they sound irrational to you, assume that they're working for the best and they're working for the fairest. Um, and uh, I think there's a there's a fundamental difference in the way people will behave if you expect a certain thing from mm-hmm. them, um, even in a business situation. But you know, sometimes somebody's job's on the line and they negotiate a bad deal with you and. I mean, we've had one other situation where it was like, oh, we didn't know you were going to charge so much, didn't quite understand the agreement, and uh, it was a much, much smaller amount of money. But um, I I think holding them to their highest and um, planning ahead of time where your concession points are. So here's how much I think, here's where we're willing to to concede, and concede slowly. So... You know, if, if you're talking about a hundred thousand dollar deal, your concession points are going to be like at a thousand dollars. All right, maybe we'll do one hundred ninety thousand. Maybe we'll do one hundred eighty thousand. I mean, I'm sorry, um, ninety nine thousand. Yeah, ninety nine thousand. Yes, you, you guys do the math. Ninety nine thousand, ninety eight thousand. Right. And um, uh, don't worry about seeming unreasonable. You can keep going, but that's where really where you find out where their point is, and mm-hmm. and, and find a, a compromise that both of you feel like. All right, I, I can take that. So lesson learned, now you don't do the paper performance. Yeah, you know, paper performance has has potentially two outcomes with the wrong organization. I wouldn't rule it out categorically, but number one, you are wildly successful with them and you become too expensive to stay keep be kept on. Or you don't. You have inconclusive tests for a long period of time. You're not making any money with them. And the the incentive is for your employees to go and go, well, I'm making money over here, so I'm going to spend more time on there. Mm-hmm. And so it never really actually gets its its fair shake past some of those early failures. So it no, it doesn't work. And when we do flat rate, fixed price consulting like we do, we don't even do hourly. Flat rate, we uh, it gives us the freedom to be as um, – do as much as we need to do to delight the customer. Yeah. And um, uh, so that's what you want. You want someone who has the resources that you're giving the resource to really yeah. put a lot of money in your pocket. Yeah. I, I recommend that you pay any company like ours a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, I could what, see what that sounded like. I could see the, 
I mean, what the the first deal that the guy made with you that they want you to be motivated, so they want they didn't want to cap it, which which I would think makes perfect sense. Yeah, you know, they want you to be motivated. So, yeah. So, what about the proudest? You know, I think that um, there's been a number of uh, proud. For me, the proudest uh, has been oh, really over the last six months. We've brought on a um, a new conversion scientist, uh, or and we've had one that's been with us for longer. But uh, the two of them really have delighted clients. Um, have been able to come in, get up the learning curve on reading the tea leaves that are the analytics and all of the other research that we do. Um, and then consistently delivering um, wins. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, in one case, we start off very rough. We had a couple of inconclusive yeah. tests. Yeah, out tell me about gate. that. Yeah. Uh, well, this, these were language tests, and, and we were changing the language on buttons. This is the barcode company. And uh, the control beat everything. <laughs> I mean, um, and we were struggling because we uh, we were struggling to get to con uh, statistical significance. So there was also a little bit of all right, should we go with this conclusion or not go with this conclusion? So it, you know, just felt very rough. And so to be able to to turn that around and turn that into a tripling of uh, conversion rate, um, just it just feels great. So we're running riding kind of a high. We have um, we're in, in demand and our uh, our process is really working. Uh, we do have tough clients, as, you know, in, in other sectors, but um, it just feels great to um, have see other people catch the disease that I got back in 2006 mm -hmm. of, oh, my gosh, this brings everything together, the, the data, the technology, the development, and the, the, the entrepreneurial side, you know, because we're really scrambling to make more money here um, to see it. Uh, pop up in your employees is feels really good is it hard to get clients to listen you know like until you triple it like if you have these inconclusive tests when you triple it they're like i'm all ears but before that in the first initial test i would think it's hard to i don't know, convince them they're used to a certain way for a long time you know actually, maybe not What's harder is so there is a lot of back and forth. The clients begin to get excited about this, and they become they come with their hypotheses, and then we say, well, you know, we have some of this data from a previous test, or we saw this over here that says that's probably not a good hypothesis, and you know, usually um, that works. I mean, we always, oftentimes, a client will come to us with a great hypothesis, like, oh my gosh, why isn't that on our list? But um, so that usually works out. What actually is is harder is. Uh, in one situation, we had a client that that sold uh, sports memorabilia online, and in Internet Explorer, if you went to their purchase page, so this is somebody who has added something to the cart, they're buying, they are going through the process, and they change the state that they live in, um, the, um, the the terms of the uh, the shopping cart change, oh. and a little little one of those little twirling rings goes off while it's going to the database and grabbing the new tax information and stuff. Well, in Internet Explorer, that didn't go away. And it was spinning right next to the credit card number field. All right, so imagine this. You're about to put your credit card number in. Right. But you're not about to enter it until the browser says it's okay, and it's spinning. And about 30 seconds in, another one popped up. And now you're like, I'm not going to give my credit card to no, these. No possible hopes. way. Yeah. 30 seconds later, another one. So you got three of these spinning things. We, uh, we designed some JavaScript that fixed it. We actually ran a test. We wanted to see how big an impact this was having because this is at the buy point. Yeah. Uh, and it was costing them over a million dollars a year. Wow. In revenue. That's amazing. And we presented this to them. And they were like, um, okay. We're like, wait a minute. What's going on here? And a lot of times when we see uh, a test that delivers a 25% increase, that generally means when we put it on the site, it's going to see a 10, 12% increase in actual um, because a lot of other things come into effect that in, change yeah. the results. And, you know, like 25%, uh, that, that seems okay. And we're doing the math. I mean, the back end was like, all right, we just made you a million and a half dollars, you know, worst case. Um, that's more perplexing to us when they no reaction. Yes, no reaction. Yes. Yeah, and there's certain organizations when you're when you're dealing with uh, someone who is more worried about 
their job. And, and in the enterprise organizations, it really is about career yeah. and career advancement. And they don't really – you can tell that this is not something that they think is going to help get them ahead. It's They're just not as excited as yeah, – It's not their know, business. With an individual yeah. owner or somebody who reports directly to the CEO or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's that's more frustrating to Love me. It. It's like we're rah rahing and they're like, yeah. silence on the other end. And you're like, what's going on here? They should be, <laughs> they should be hiring a marching band and marching right. Through Maybe our they're office. covering the phone and just screaming or something. I don't know. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Brian, this has been an absolute pleasure. Where can we point people towards? Where pe- you know we mentioned a few sites. Where should people go to check out more? You know, everything we learn, we write about. We are really a teaching organization because that's what it's going to take to get more of these websites uh, up and, and optimizing. So come mm-hmm. to conversionscientist.com. Yep. And uh, we post several times a week there, case studies, yep. head scratchers, things we've learned. Yep. There's a lot of audio. There's a lot of video. We've got a podcast. If you like to listen to things on the commute. Um, and, uh, you know, We've got the data that answers some of the questions you, that are, I know are burning in your little brains. So. Yeah. Conversion scientist. Yeah, I was reading one this morning. Why no one is reading your emails. That was a good one. I like that yeah, one. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There's a bunch Everything of others. Fair game, yes. Yeah. Uh, and also, you'll be able to download that report if you're in the university world. Um, we're going to be doing those reports. We're going to do doing at least one a month in, for different industries. So, um uh, absolutely go to the contact page and send me an email if you want us to do your industry. All right. Yeah, see. I have someone to introduce you to with the universities actually now that – so we're off. I'll, I'll tell you about that. But awesome. um, so any final thoughts? Any final thoughts? So um, entrepreneurs, I, you know, um, those of you that are embarking on in any business right now are going to have a website to support it. Um, I can't think of an exception. And you're going to go hire a web developer or maybe do that yourself uh, and a designer to tell you what to do. Um, the, a marketer today is not going to be able to go off and do that anymore. But the good news is that the data is ready, ava- readily available. If you're not a little afraid to get a little mathy, maybe understand a little statistics, but I strongly recommend that go and poke around in analytics, make sure that you've got this Google Analytics free tool installed, um, and start um, building this database so you can test your stuff. That's yeah. that's where it all starts. Start poking around, and I know most entrepreneurs are pokers. They're gonna get to know just enough about a space that they feel confident, um, either winging it or hiring. They can competently hire somebody who can do it for them. You need to be doing that on the data side because it will accelerate your growth, especially out of the gate when those few precious leads, those few precious sales, or those few precious users yeah. will make or break your business. Yeah. Awesome, Brian. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. I'm glad I could come. Awesome. Awesome.